Hi everyone, and welcome back to the Raven's Table. Today, we're going to talk about a game of ancient Egypt called Mehen. This game, which was named after an Egyptian snake god, has a game board that is shaped like a coiled serpent. Mehen's exact rules and gameplay aren't exactly known for sure, but historians believe that up to six people were able to play the game simultaneously. Therefore, this is likely the oldest game allowing for more than two players. Here's an example of a Mehen board. In this and most historical examples, the game is played along the curve of the snake's body, thereby making the connection to the ancient snake god quite clear. The spiral nature of the game also imitates the natural posture of a snake protecting her eggs. But before we get into how to play the game, let's talk history. So as I said before, this game is named for Mehen, with the name itself meaning Coiled One. This makes sense because Mehen was a protective deity who would wrap himself around the sun god Ra every day during his journey through the night in the underworld. The earliest references to Mehen as a game occur in what are called the coffin texts. These were a collection of ancient Egyptian funerary spells written on coffins beginning in the first intermediate period, which lasted from about 2181 to 2055 BCE. The best depiction of the game itself appears in a picture in the tomb complex of Mastaba of Heseri at Saqqara. The image shows the game board and gaming pieces associated with a Mehen board, namely lions and six sets of six marbles. In Old Kingdom religious documents known as the Pyramid Texts, it is suggested that attainment in the afterlife was achievable by successfully passing through the Mehen game board. By reaching the center of the spiral, one would symbolically join Ra on his sky barge. After the Old Kingdom came to an end in 2181 BCE, the game seemed to die out in Egypt, largely replaced by other games such as Senet and Aseb. However, it continued to be played outside of Egypt in areas of the globe now covered by the nations of Palestine, Syria, Cyprus, and Crete. In 1925, Reginald Davies, who was a British colonial administrator, found a very similar game being played by the Bagara Arabs of Sudan. They called it the Hyena Game. This game shared many similar characteristics of the board shape and pieces to Mehen, with the biggest difference being in the number of game pieces allotted to each player. So now let's take a look at some boards and game pieces that have been rediscovered by archaeologists. This board is made from a composite ceramic material and was found in Pharaoh Seth Perebsem's tomb and was crafted somewhere between 2770 and 2650 BCE. It is currently on display at the Louvre in Paris. This board is dated from 2750 to 2250 BCE and is being displayed at the University of Chicago's Oriental Institute Museum. This board and associated game pieces crafted from jade have been dated to approximately 3000 BCE and currently reside at the Egyptian Museum of Berlin. This lion game piece was made from ivory and was crafted in ancient Abydos and dates from about 3000 BCE. These lion pieces and board are currently on display at the Cairo Egyptian Museum and were also carved from ivory. So now, let's have some fun and learn how to play Mehen. Okay, so uh, before we actually get into how to play the game, I'm going to start off with a disclaimer. So this game, as is the case with many things ancient, has been partially reconstructed based on fragmentary information, right? So we know, we saw the boards earlier, we saw the pieces earlier, and, you know, there's little bits of information, oral history, etc., that have been passed down over time, but, you know, this may not be the way it was exactly played back then. So because it's been reconstructed by, you know, archaeologists, enthusiasts, etc., um, there are many variations of the game out there. So I'm going to show you one way to play. I think it's a, a fairly common way, but it's not the only way. So I, I say all that to, to let you know that when you sit down and play this game with somebody for the first time, it's important that you agree with them ahead of the game under which rules you'll be playing. Because otherwise they may be playing a variation that you're not aware of and you get halfway through the game and an argument starts, right? So just at the beginning of the game, sit down, make sure you both agree. You'll have a lot more fun. So this is a fairly typical man board. Uh, it is shaped like a coiled serpent. You have... Uh, the head space and the tail space here with 65 here in the center or between the two 
not all boards are going to have ex this exact layout or this same number of spaces. Believe it or not, the number of spaces doesn't really matter. They'll all have the tail and the head, but some may have 20, some may have 100. The, the rules for the game will remain the same. The only difference is the more spaces that are on here, the longer the game will be. Um, so just, just be aware of that. I think the 65 number is maybe a little bit on the high side, but not, not crazily so. Each player here has, has seven pieces. You have six that are shaped one or that are colored one color and then two darker ones. So you have your six normal pieces and then the darker one for each player is the lion piece. So we saw a lot of actual lion pieces earlier. I just don't have any that are shaped like lions. So pretend that the darker piece is the lion piece for each side. And the setup for the game is everything starts off the board with the exception that the lions are all in the center. And this game is played with what are called stick dice. These, these are stick dice. They are sticks that are shaped that are used for, as dice. In this case, they are, they are um, binary dice. You know, it's kind of like a, a coin. You have heads and tails, right? You have some stick dice that are like this one where the sides are flat, and therefore you have a 50-50 chance of rolling. Or you have ones like these where one side is convex. You see it's, it's uh, curved, but then the other side is flat. And what that does is that adjusts the odds slightly. Um, we're going to go ahead and play with these ones because I think it makes it a little bit more fun. But you can even play this game with coins, like I said. So, um, how are these dice scored? Well, it, it's, it's pretty simple. In this case, we're going to say, we're going to be counting the number of light sides that land up. You, you just you cast them on the board like you would normally, and we're counting the light, light sides. So, that, how does this work? So, one light side is scored as a one, two is a two, and, you guessed it, three is a three. So, nice and simple. Well, what happens, you may ask, is if you roll that. Well, that's not a zero, as you, you may guess. It actually doubles it, and you rolled a six. So again, real quick, one, two, three, and six. Okay. This game is played in uh, two phases. First off, everything starts off of the board, and your first job is to get all of your pieces onto this tail, because that's where they all start from. And then that begins phase one for you. During phase one, you're taking, you're trying to get all six of your pieces inside the center here on the head by following the, the body of the serpent. And then once you get all six of your pieces in here, you pick up your lion. And then at that point, all seven of your pieces, your job is to get all seven of them back out and back out to the tail. And that ends phase one for that player. And then phase two starts for that player where all the pieces are still here. And again, you're trying to get all of your pieces to the head by following the, the body. And then once all seven of them are here, you spiral back out and get back out to here. But the difference is for phase two, that's when your lion gets to eat the opponent's pieces. because And that's important because the winner of the game is the player that eats the most opponent's pieces. Okay, But you don't get to eat pieces until phase two. So again, real brief. Phase one, spiral in, get your lion, spiral out, get it back to the tail. Phase two. Spiral in with your lion, eating pieces as you go along. And then once you get to the head, spiral back out again, eating pieces as you go along until all of your places, pieces are back here. And then once all players have all of their pieces back to the tail, whoever ate the most wins. Okay, so let's talk movement. So like I mentioned, all these pieces stay, start off of the board. Uh, the way that you get pieces onto the tail to, to you know, eventually start moving is by rolling a one on these dice. So... Pretty simple. Um, until you get all six of your pieces onto the tail, you don't get to move. So you want to roll six ones as quickly as possible, so that way you can start the game. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, by the way, this pad of paper will come in useful a little bit later. I'll explain why when we get to that point. So for right now, we're just going to say, okay, player one, you're going to throw your dice and roll to two. So in this case, it's not a one, so nothing happens. So play will pass to player two. Player two will roll. Got a one. So great. So they get a piece onto the tail. All right, player one. Got a three, nothing happens, play passes on over. Got a six, again, nothing happens. So back to player one. Got a two, nothing happens. And to player two. Let's, I didn't actually roll that one, I just slid out of my hand, let's say. 
and we got a two so again nothing happens so let's in in interest of time let's just say let's let's pretend that we've been doing this for a bit and player two ends up getting all of their pieces onto the tail but player one has only got most of their pieces on the tail let's say they got all but one of them or they're, they're still missing one by the way the position inside the tail doesn't matter at all it's just just they're all in the they all have the same starting position irrespective of where they actually are in the lineup okay so let's say it's it's player two's turn so player two is going to roll the dice and roll to one okay so here's here's an interesting rule of the game for purposes of movement ones are only good for getting pieces onto the board anytime after that what you roll a one you don't get to use it for move you don't get to like move one space like that what you do is you record those one rolls for use later in the game and i'll, I'll explain when we get to that point why they're useful um, it may seem like you're kind of having being forced to skip a turn but believe me these these saves later will become useful so for right now i'm just going to record that and then we'll move on so player one hopefully will roll a one so they can get their piece onto the tail and start moving well they didn't so over to player two Player two, got a two, so one, two. Nice and easy. Player one, got a two, which is not good for them. Player two, got a one, and record that. Player one, got a two. I really wish they had been rolling ones. Player two, Got a six, so we are going to move another piece out of the tail. Go one, two, three, four, five, six. So as you can see, you can jump over other pieces. That's perfectly legit. Player one. Finally got their one. So now they have a piece on the tail. We'll just put it right there. And now they can start moving on their next turn. So player two. Got a two. Okay, so here, here's a, a thing. Each one of these spaces can only have one piece on it at a time, and that includes your own pieces. So you couldn't go like one, two, and have two sitting there like that. It's 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 no good. Um, so our options here: we can either move that one ahead two or that one ahead two. So in this case, I think we're going to go ahead and move that one ahead two to right there. Okay. So player one got a one. Okay. So we're going to save that and continue. Player two, got another two. We're just gonna go one, two, and put that there. Okay, player one, got a two. Okay, so again, you can't have two pieces sharing the same space, so what happens when an opponent does that? Well, in this case, you go one, two, stomp, take that position, and trade places. So in this case, it ends up going back to the tail. But if we were later in the game and say we were you know, here, and you went one, two, three, four, stomp, then you would just trade places and go back to here. It's just in this case, it happens to go back to the tail. So now player one has a, game on, a piece on the board. So we'll do a couple more passes. Okay, we got a, another six here. So one, two, three. We're going to move this one. One, two, three, four, five, six. And let's just do one more. Got another one. Okay. So in purpose, oops, sorry for bumping the camera there. For purposes of uh, an interest of time, we're going to advance the game a little bit. We're going to pretend that we're, we're getting close to having um, a lot of pieces ready to enter the uh, the head of the snake. So let's say we're some, looking at something like, uh, I don't know, this. I'm going to put that one there and that one there. Okay. So, in order to enter the head of the snake, you have to roll exactly. So let's say we're talking about this this blue piece here. You would have to roll a two, one, two, to land in there. So now you ask, well, what about this piece right here? It's a one, and ones don't you don't get to move for. So the way that works is that's where these saves come in. In if you're trying to get into the head and you want to reduce your score, you can spend you can spend one of these and rem, and drop your score by one. Or you can spend two of them, drop your score by two. By, the, by this time, we probably would have had a lot more saved up. So just, just know that you can reduce your score by whatever number of these that you want to spend. Okay. And then again, like I said, you're trying to get all of your pieces into the head of the snake. 
So you can grab your line and then start spiraling your spiraling your way out. So let, let's play this out a little bit. So let's say it's player one's turn. Player one rolls, got a three. So we're just going to go one, two, three. And now player one has as one of their pieces inside the head. Player two got a two. Okay. Well, we could, you know, go one, two, stop. But I think what we're going to do. We're going. I'm going to show you what I was talking about earlier. So I want to move this piece in but I have to reduce it by one. So I'm going to spend, you know, scratch out one of these right here. So it's no longer there. Spend one, reduce it by one. So now I'm in. That's, that's how that works. Um, and then you continue play as, as normal. So let's say that by the end of this, let's say player one ends up getting all of their pieces into the head. I'm going to go ahead and move these line pieces out for a moment, just because there's not a whole lot of physical space in there, but pretend they're, pretend they're still there. So let's say we've played for a, a while longer and uh, you know, player one got all of theirs in, player two is almost there, but, but not quite. Okay, but now when it's player one's turn, they pick up their line and start moving out and everything works exactly the same way. You roll, you move pieces, and you score exactly the same way, with one exception. If you choose to move your line with, with your roll, your line moves double whatever you rolled. So if you if you rolled a two, your line is actually going to move four. If you roll a three, the line is going to move six. And if you roll a six, your line actually moves twelve. So the line's very very fast during phase two, or sorry, during this this whenever they move, just irrespective of what phase they're in, because you're still in phase one here. So and lines are not eating pieces yet. So you're just going to roll as normal. You're trying to get all seven of your pieces all the way out here to the tail. And then once they're all, once you get all of your pieces to the tail, then phase two for that player starts. So let, let, again, let's advance the game in the interest of time. So let's say player two ends up getting all of their pieces out to the tail, including the lion. But then player one has got most of their pieces here. Uh, let's say they got, um, let's say the, the lion's still sitting there. They got a couple more pieces out like this. And uh, so they, they still have, they're still, player one is still working their way towards the tail, but now player two, because they got all their pieces here, is going to start working their way inward, and they're in phase two. So now, for player two, their line can start eating pieces. Okay, so let's, let's, let's play that out a bit. So let's say it's player two's turn. And by the way, I don't think I mentioned it. Getting a piece into the tail is exactly the same way as getting it into the head. You have to roll exactly, and you can spend some of these saves in order to get a piece landed on the tail. Okay. All right, so let's say it's player two's turn. So player two is going to roll and roll the two. So what we're going to do here in this case is we could take a normal piece and go one, two, and then trade, but we don't want to do that because that actually helps player one by getting a piece onto the tail. We're going to take our lion, though, and since lions move double, we're going to go one, two, three, four, nom, and eat that piece. And now that is a victory point for player two. And, and player one is now reduced by, by one piece. And you don't, you don't ever get those back. Okay, so now it's player one's turn. Player one got a three. I think we're going to... Well, the only move available to us, because we can't, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. Yep, let's move the lion into there. We could have spent, gone one, two, and burned one of these, but we're just going to go ahead and move that line in. All right, so player two's turn. Player two rolls a three. We're just going to go one, two, three, and move a piece there. Okay, player one. Player one rolls a one. I'm still recording these like normal. Player two. Roll a one. Player one rolls a six, and they don't have enough points to reduce enough to get into here. So in this case, they they they, they cannot make a legal move and are, are forced to skip. If they had four saves because they could at that point make a legal move they're kind of forced to make that legal move but in this case there's no way to make it work so player two got a two we're gonna go if you don't want to swap we're just gonna go one two and move there 
player one. Another one. Player two. Another one. Player one. Got a three. Okay, so here we're going to go one, two, burn one of these. Okay, and now, even though they're down by one, player one is now in phase two. So they're going to start moving all of their pieces out along the board this way, and they can start eating pieces as well. So, player two. Got a two. So let's say one, two. Player one. Got a two or a four if you want to move your line. Now here's 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 the thing. We could go one, two, three, four and land on lions, but see lions don't eat other lions. If a lion lands on a lion, they just trade places like two normal pieces would. Um, so in this case, we could do that, forcing the other person back. But I don't think they want to do that. I think we're just going to go one, two, stomp and and trade places. Okay, player two. Got a two. Well, guess what? One, two, stomp, trade. Player one. Two. Guess what? Stomp, trade. Well, this is getting a little bit repetitive. One, two, bang, stomp, trade. Player one. Okay, got a one. Okay, so... Just in, in interest of time, I'll just kind of describe the way the rest of this game works out. So just like you did in phase one, you spiral all your pieces towards the inside. And then, you know, there's there's nothing to pick up this time. Then you spiral all your pieces back out and you're eating, your line is eating pieces all the way. You know, And then once all of a player's pieces gets out to the tail, however many are left, because you're probably going to have a few eaten along the way. Once all your remaining pieces are on the tail, that person's movement ends. But the other players, if they still have pieces out on the board, they continue to move. And then once all pieces are on the tail, whoever ate the most wins. And in the case of a tie, let's say both players ate four pieces. Whoever got all their pieces to the tail first is the winner. And in the rare case where sometimes all the pieces will get eaten before anybody gets to the tail, then whoever gets to the tail first with their remaining line wins. So that is Mehen in a nutshell. Okay, so now let's cover some of the variants that I'm aware of uh, for this game. This is not going to be a comprehensive list. Undoubtedly, there are variants that I haven't heard of yet. If there's something that you're aware of that I haven't covered, please feel free to leave a comment below. I'd, I'd love to hear it. Because I think that's one of the fun things about historical gaming is learning those variations keeps the game interesting. In fact, it's, it's possible that the game was played differently in different areas of the world, just a local customs, culture, etc. Um, so we already talked about how you can vary the number of spaces on a board. You can play with you know, 10, 50, 100. It just makes the game longer or shorter. And we also showed how you can vary the number of pieces that each player gets. Uh, you can also vary the scoring system you use for these dice. And I showed you earlier where it's you know, one, two, three, and then six. One way I've seen it done is one, two, four, and then eight, meaning it doubles each time. You can come with whatever scoring system you like. It's, it's completely up to you. Another uh, common thing that I've seen, rather than using dice or coins, what you can do is kind of a guessing game. So what happens is each player will get six tokens, and these aren't used in the game other than for this guessing part portion. So the way this works is one player, let's say player one, takes their six tokens, and they go back and they hide, and they put them in their hand without revealing to their opponent, and they say, guess how many tokens are in my hand? And in this case, player two is going to guess. And they say, player two guesses five. Player one will reveal, in this case, there's two. So what you do is you take the difference between the two, and that's how many spaces you get to move. So in this case, five minus two is three. So player one, we get to move a piece three spaces. Um, and that, that could be plus or minus. So let's say, you know, this is what we're looking at. And player two guesses one, and there's five. It's, so the difference is four, and that's how many spaces they get to move. But if you do this and you say, okay, guess, player two guesses 
two, oh, and there's two pieces here, then player one would lose their turn because the difference is zero. They don't get to move that round. So in that version, you want to try and guess as accurately as possible whatever your opponent is hiding. That's where it makes a little bit of a kind of a psychology aspect to the game. Uh, so I've, I showed you before where pieces can't share spaces with, with each other. I have seen some people will there, where they will say that lions can share spaces with each other. Not very common, but I have seen it. Um, I have seen it where if, let's say, you know, this is the situation we're looking at, and let's say the, the player two here rolls a, a two, uh, that it, these two would swap just like normal because it's, it's the... It's the null piece landing on the lion, stomping it and trading. But I've also seen it where uh, even if a... If, let's say they're forced to make this move. It's the only legal move they can make. That even though they stop this lion, I mean, it's still a human versus a lion. And you know, especially back in the ancient world, lion's going to win pretty much every time. So even in this case, that lion still eats this piece and it counts as a, a victory point for, for their side. Um, so you, you can play whichever variation you want there. Uh, I've also seen it where normally... If a lion lands on another lion, they just trade places like this. But what you could do is, rather than, let's say there's a you know, person rolls a two again, which for a lion means it's four. Instead of going one, two, three, stomp and trading, you go one, two, or here, one, two, three, four, and then bounce off an equivalent number to what you rolled. So it'd be one, two, three, four, bounce, one, two, three, four. So you kind of think of it kind of like Super Mario Brothers. You just bounce off their head and keep going. So that can make the game a little bit interesting. Um, I've seen it where uh, lions can eat normal pieces just by jumping over them. You can land on them and eat a piece, or if you jump over a piece, you also eat them. So that can, kind of makes it like checkers. And playing that way is fun, but it makes the game go faster because it's you're going to jump over a piece more frequently than you'll actually land on a piece. And then the final uh, variation that I'll, I'll discuss is I showed you before where when you're in phase two and you get all of your pieces all the way back out and onto the tail, that at that point your turn ends. Some people will, will not have the movement and they'll just, okay, you just, you're still in phase two. You can continue to play going in, going out, and you just repeat, repeat until somebody wins the game. And uh, that, so that, that kind of can make the game go a little bit longer, but it's a it's a perfectly way, a valid way to play the game. So that's it. Again, if you have a variation that I didn't cover, please please feel feel free to leave a comment below. So that's it for today's look into Mehen. I hope you've enjoyed this glimpse into one of humanity's oldest games. If you look in the video description, there's a link to a document that contains instructions on how to play as well as a printable game board. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave a comment below or if you have suggestions for future video topics, I'd love to hear those as well. Be sure to stay subscribed for more videos looking at gaming history, as well as how you can make your own games and accessories. So until next time, I wish you luck and look forward to seeing you again at the Raven's Table.